I believe it's the fifth installment of our uh, CSP Lunch and Learn, focusing on monitoring and responding to endpoint threats and attacks, uh, with a primary focus on Defender for Endpoint or Defender ATP. Uh, my goal in this session is I'm going to spend some time in the slides, but I really want to get into the Defender Council and show you what some of the features are and run through some actual intrusion demo. So anytime I go through this, whether it's the slides or bouncing around in the council, or I should say councils, portals, uh, stop me. If you want to, uh, you can just interrupt me or you can raise your virtual hand in Teams and, and someone will uh, stop me and, and we'll get the question answered. Um, why don't we start with Chris? Can you do you want to go through our upcoming modern endpoint management roadmap before we uh, we proceed? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, on screen here is our schedule for our webinar series. You can see that we've got uh, um, several that we've already completed here, and they are recorded and available at the URL there, which is our uh, CSP website under our improving main website, but. Uh, the one we're in today is monitor and respond to endpoint threats and attacks. And our next one in June will be on uh, BitLocker deployment and management. I believe uh, Chris Ball will be presenting on that one. If not, I just put him on the spot. So he's going to be presenting that one now. <laughs> but uh, if you have not registered, we do have uh, links for registration up on the uh, the Improving CSP website as well. So feel free to go ahead and use that link to register for our upcoming webinars. OK. So the agenda for this session is we're going to talk about some changes with Defender for Endpoint or DFE. Uh, we're going to discuss the differences between Defender for Endpoint and Defender Antivirus. Uh, we're going to go into some details on how it actually works. Uh, then we're going to go into the portal and review different portals, actually. Then we're going to jump into some labs. We're going to walk through the council itself, some of the features of the councils, and then run through some intrusion and simulation labs. Then we're going to do a um, discuss some new features, some new roadmap features of Defender for Endpoint, and then end with the uh, uh, a recap of the schedule. What's in a name? I think we should start with identifying the changes Microsoft seem to make weekly, if not daily, on the naming and branding of some of their products. Um, as you may have been familiar with, Defender Advanced Threat Protection, or Defender ATP, is now Defender for Endpoint. Um, why they change these product names at such a a frantic pace, I'm not sure. It could be a rebranding effort, merging products, but whatever. Defender ATP is now Defender for Endpoint. Uh, Azure ATP is now Defender for Identity. And even the antivirus client on your local workstation has changed. It is now uh, officially Microsoft Defender Antivirus. So Windows Defender is now Microsoft Defender Antivirus. Uh, and to be honest, these names could change next week. But for now, as of today, those are the security products from Microsoft. So the first question I get a lot is, what is the difference between Defender for Endpoint and Microsoft Defender Antivirus? So antivirus, the local antivirus client, you can see as a signature-based threat protection product. Its, its, its scope or its limit is recognizing known bad files, known bad um, uh, events. Whereas Defender for Endpoint watches for unusual behavior that might or might not indicate a problem. And it will then take actions, or if you allow it, to take action to remediate. Uh, one of these is uh, air or automated investigation and response. So again, Defender, um, the local antivirus resolves known issues, Defender for Endpoint watches patterns to see what may be different or what may have changed. So in saying that, how does Defender for Endpoint do this pattern analysis? Well, what it does is it uses uh, behavioral analysis to detect anomalies. It's more of a post-breach investigative tool. So how this works under the hood is Defender 
uh, for endpoint essentially creates stored events within the core of the operating system. So when a new event is inconsistent from past ones, calling into question, for example, whether uh, the person is using uh, an authorized user identity, then DFE feeds this data or metadata about this event to Azure. Then the system builds a collection of behavioral patterns of data and looks for abnormal patterns. So in a real world practice, say uh, for an example, a user opens a Word document with an attachment uh, in, in Outlook or a Word document attachment in Outlook. Uh, that kicks off a PowerShell pro process that touches a bunch of files. Um, a signature-based tool such as a Windows Defender antivirus won't recognize that as being a problem, but Defender for Endpoint would or could detect that the PowerShell activity is abnormal for this user and this process. Uh, it would then trigger uh, and take action based off of your configuration settings. So really that's the, the baseline of what Defender for Endpoint does. It monitors behaviors on a machine, and if it detects something abnormal, that's when it the magic happens. Um, there's a lot more to the product as it's maturing. There's a, there's a lot of cool features that we'll touch on some of these, but that again, as a baseline, that's what uh, Defender for Endpoint does. So next I wanted to talk about the uh, portals. So Defender for Endpoints has really three places you can do your things. You can use the newest, and it was in preview, I think, until this very week. I think the beginning of this week or last Friday, it is now in production. It's the Microsoft 365 security portal. Uh, in this portal, what it's done is merged multiple products into one center. Uh, it brings Defender for Endpoint, Defender for Office 365, Microsoft 365 Defender, all into one portal. So let me jump into this and just show you a couple of these portals. So this is the brand new portal that again merges the uh, Defender for Endpoint, email and collaboration or O365 um, products. So it kind of merges them all together into one location. Um, I wouldn't probably jump into this just yet. I'm sure they'll need to work out some bugs and whatnot, but sooner than later, this is going to be the uh, portal that you're gonna use for all of these security features. Um, the next piece of Defender for Endpoint that is, um, that has some configuration is Microsoft Endpoint Manager or MEM, which is the Intune console. This has some features of uh, Defender for Endpoint that really do with configuration. So you can actually set up security baselines. You can do a Defender for Endpoint baseline. Um, you can set up what automated activities you would like Defender for Endpoint to do, uh, such as you can control whether or not you want them to kick off an automated investigation and remediation, or you just want to notify a security admin of uh, a possible uh, a breach. Uh, as well, you can do, um, you could actually configure the integration between Defender for Endpoint in Intune, um, or I should say MEM, because natively they're not connected, so you actually have to do a few things to connect them together so they can feed information back and forth. And lastly, but not leastly, is the Defender uh, Security Center. Uh, again, this is where up until recently all the Defender for Endpoint Management operations uh, was done. Um, but as you can see from the big splash screen on the homepage, hey, we have a new home. So they are pushing you, go, pushing you to go to Microsoft 365 Security, uh, which you should probably start playing around with to get familiar with it. Any questions? Okay. Hey, Rick, I have a specific question, I guess. Sure. Uh, when you're talking about the configuration pieces, can you do things like control USB, those kind of things, uh, access to USB or um, drives plugged in with the endpoint? 
You can. Yep, you can control features like uh, USB permissions. You can control features on what gets encrypted, for example. Um, yeah, there's there are hundreds, literally hundreds of settings you can set, and that is one of them. All right, perfect. Thanks. You're welcome. So the next thing I want to do is jump into the actual um, Defender portal itself or the dashboard, and let's go through all the components of it and some of the features of it so you get familiar with it. So the dashboard, the very first page that most uh, security operations administrators uh, go to is the security operations dashboard. This provides um, high level information on any active current alerts, any active automated investigations going on, and we'll, we'll touch into what those are in more detail later. Um, it can show devices at risk, users at risk, um, devices that aren't onboarded properly or their sensor issues, uh, as well as the bottom pane shows you all the onboarded active devices in your environment. So again, the security portal is a good or security operations portal is a good place to start for admins to see what is going on at that very second. The next uh, component in the dashboard is called threat analytics. This is a rarely used um, uh, uh, pane, but it actually has a lot of good information. Not only does it provide information on uh, known popular exploits, uh, threats, but it also tells you about new ones that are just uh, occurring or, or some information on ones that could occur regarding, it could be regarding drivers, it could be regarding um, ransomware, things like that. So this is a really good, um, I know we don't have tons of time to, to do reading and studying up, but this is a great place to learn about what is currently going on in the threat universe. So the next item in the portal is incidents. Now, the great thing that Defender for Endpoint has done, it, it uses um, logic to put known issues or breaches or, or incidents into one ticket, you could say, or one incident. So let's say there were uh, seven alerts, but all seven of them are the same type of activity. It lumps it all into one incident under the incident panel which is a nice way to not be overwhelmed with data and see, oh, this, uh, this breach, this happened on these machines. Um, and we will, and we're gonna go into some details. We're gonna jump into a live portal here in a minute and I'll show you what some of these look like and how you can drill down and see what's going on. Uh, device inventory. This is a list of all your onboarded devices, um, your device health. It's just a good place to see, uh, take a snapshot of your devices. Alerts, so alerts are, as I mentioned, incidents are a roll up of all the same type of alerts. Alerts are individual alerts on one machine, many machines. Um, so this is where all your one-off issues are um, acute. And in here, you can drill down the specifics of an alert. What type of uh, activity is it? Uh, how many machines is it affected? Um, what's nice about this too is I'll show you there's a graph that really pulls out how far this is spread, um, what components it's uh, impacting. So it's uh, this is a good place to really see what's going on with the activity. The next, next category I mentioned uh, earlier was automated investigations. You can set this up through um, the settings of Defender uh, Security Center, but also you can set some of this up in Intune or Microsoft Endpoint Manager as well. You can set up for um, Defender for Endpoint to automatically begin resolving these issues, scrubbing the files, removing scheduled tag, you know, doing whatever it identifies is the problem. Um, a lot of clients I work with don't set this to automate. Uh, they pretty much set it to send me a notification, send me an email saying something has occurred. I want to go in and, and take a look before anything is remediated. Um, but this uh, functionality is here. 
you can set it, set it and forget it. So, um, and it works pretty well. If it can detect it, it usually can resolve it. Advanced hunting and reports is basically uh, reports of your canned uh, reports, whether it's threat protection, device health, vulnerable devices. Um, advanced hunting is basically um, que uh, building custom queries to, let's say you want to know uh, a specific file that's on every device. Let's say you want to know what device events or what events happened for a device in the past year. So this is basically custom queries. It's pretty easy to use. It's pretty logical uh, query building. Um, the next one is partner and APIs. This is a list of basically you can consider add-ins. These are add-ins you can incorporate into Defender uh, for endpoint to have either added functionality, added um, threat protection, added um, uh, reporting, things like that. Um, actually, I want to stop here. Do you, uh, Chris, would you like to touch on the new web filtering product that's been uh, integrated into Defender? Uh, sure, yeah, I can speak a little bit to that. So, um, web filtering at the endpoints, you know, a lot of uh, organizations will do a network appliance that monitors all their outbound network traffic and try to restrict traffic to certain inappropriate sites, gambling sites, things like that. Um, but with Defender for Endpoint, you actually have that capability built into Defender itself. So at the endpoint, the policy gets applied to prevent uh, windows from reaching those sites. So, you know, in this work from home environment where everyone's working remotely, um, you know, they're not always VPN into the corporate network. Uh, and therefore, their network traffic is not being uh, managed and monitored by uh, those um, those network appliances. So now with Endpoint, uh, Defender for Endpoint, you can make sure that your endpoints aren't reaching out to inappropriate locations because Defender for Endpoint knows how to do that filtering. And it just pretty much blocks the, uh, the website from loading in the local browser. So there is some configuration in that, um, and I don't wanna get too far off your track, Rick, but there is some configuration with uh, um, setting up policy to assign you know, what sites are restricted and they're categorized. We're not, we're not necessarily putting in a specific URLs, uh, not that you couldn't, but there's uh, categories that classify certain sites based on threat intelligence feeds that Microsoft has actually licensed from uh, one of our partners, Siren. Um, you may have heard some of our announcements around Siren and their inbox security. Well, Siren is one of the leaders in uh, uh, threat intelligence and threat feeds, and Microsoft has licensed that capability uh, for the Defender for Endpoint web filtering. Okay, excellent. So moving on from the partners and APIs, um, we have threat and vulnerability management. I think the big component in this um, area is what is called a, uh, what is called secure score. Um, there's no data here. We're going to jump into the other lab and I'll show you secure score. But basically, it gives your organization a security score. Uh, the higher the score, the better. And What's nice about it is it shows you low hanging fruit. It shows you ways to increase your security score. Let's say it notices a large amount of machines don't have the latest Windows updates or the, a certain patch. Um, it shows that maybe one of your products, uh, .NET is a famous one. You know, you're know, you using a version of .NET that isn't supported and, and is vulnerable. Um, especially if you're meeting, if you need to meet uh, certain industry requirements, PCI, HIPAA, whatever it is, and you need to get to a certain level, security score is a great way to go in and see how you can easily uh, resolve some of these security issues. Um, and, and, and they give you some specific details on how to do it as well. So security score is a great way to, to uh, improve the security of your environment. So the next area is evalu evaluation and tutorials. We're going to be going into this a lot more next, uh, but this is where you can set up an evaluation lab and do simulations and tutorials. Uh, service health is basically the overall health of the um, 
Defender for Endpoint service and the onboarding service. So if there's any issues, it'll let you know. Uh, configuration management is specific to endpoints. How are your connection with Intune, device attack service management? So it basically is endpoint um, and interaction or device configuration management. Settings has a has a large group of things. Some of them are pretty relevant. Uh, for example, um, you can do email notifications. So I mentioned, let's say you don't want to do uh, automated investigations. You want to email an administrator, security administrator of uh, an event that has occurred. Well, you can add some email and different types of uh, 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 email configurations here. Uh, advanced features. This is a, a lot of ways to interact with other products. So you can do uh, integration with uh, 365 threat intelligence. You can integration with um, Intune, things like that. Um, uh, so yeah, this is where you can uh, connect or allow and block files. Let's say uh, you keep getting a false positive. Here's where you can add files to say ignore, things like that. Uh, auto remediation. Again, you can set auto, auto remediation levels. If it's a considered a high impact event, you can then trigger auto remediation. If it's a low impact event, maybe you'll just have an email sent to you. Um, Roles, device group, these are areas where you can set up uh, access roles, um, uh, permissions for certain groups, things like that. Um, so there's, there's, there's some other things in here. You can set up indicators, uh, alert suppression, again, for false positive, things like that. And at the bottom is onboarding and offboarding. So um, for those who haven't really played with Defender for Endpoint or did no rollouts yet, there's, there's certain ways uh, you can onboard and offboard devices. You can download a script. Uh, you can download a package. Um, you can set up a group policy. Um, you can do uh, a Microsoft or a uh, MEM or SECM uh, package. Um, you can even do mobile device management Intune uh, installers uh, for the product. And speaking of that too, it's not just Windows 10. You can now, they now, as of today, you can do many server environments, Windows 7, uh, Mac OS, Linux, iOS, and Android. So all these are supported and um, uh, you can manage through Defender Security Center. Hey, Rick, uh, there's a question in the chat on training for some of these is you know, around best practices. Um, I know in deploying this for a number of our clients, um, you and the endpoint team have a number of best practices on onboarding that type of stuff. Um, is it specific to the customer or the, the customer's environment or are there some overall best practices uh, as you think about deploying Defender? It, there. I guess the the over every cust every client is different, but I guess the overall best practice is to start small and then grow your uh, security baseline, your configuration baseline, um, because a lot of times some of the intrusions, detections, and especially if automated guest investigations are enabled, I've seen it where a Word document is trying to be disseminated, a a safe Word document disseminated to multiple people, and it's keeps getting stripped out, right? So I would um, I would always start small and then grow your uh, detection or your protection footprint. Uh, so I guess that would be the industry recommendation. But as far as how to deploy, um, the cadence to deploy, um, whether or not you want um, automated investigations, what your configuration profile looks like, that is completely different per organization. Okay, next let's jump into, well, I guess we're gonna jump into the labs. So we're going to cover um, a, we're gonna set up an evaluation lab. We're gonna run through a simulation or two. We're going to do a uh, backdoor uh, exploit and then a fileless attack um, intrusion. So let me go back into the council. 
Now, again, this is our council that doesn't have any data in it, but I wanted to show you how the evaluation lab works because this is a fantastic product, especially if you're new to the product and you want to see how things work and how um, the Defender for Endpoint shows intrusions and what it, how, what it does for intrusions. The evaluation lab is fantastic for a couple of reasons. So let me just walk you through the setup of a lab. We're not going to wait for the devices to uh, the VMs to build because I already have that set up and it will take too long. But so let's say you want to do three test VMs and then you want to last for 72 hours. Um, you have to agree to the Microsoft privacy statements. And you also, I strongly recommend if you do this to add two vendor products for the simulation, Attack IQ and Safe Breach. They provide some great uh, tools in analytics for uh, simulations. So I would add those as well. So just have to add this information. And we'll click next. And that's it. And then you click set up lab. And what this will do is it will build three VMs in your um, Defender Security Center uh, evaluation lab environment. And once those machines are built, they'll actually give you accounts you can log into them with, and then you can run simulations. Now, the difference between a simulation and in actual um, uh, tutorials is that the simulations don't actually do anything. You just click a button and it spoofs the actual activity and shows it in uh, the uh, Defender Security Center. So let's jump into a populated environment. Okay, so if I go under the evaluation lab, you can see that I've built three test devices, test machine one, two, and three. Um, to connect to those devices, you uh, just click connect over at the right-hand side. And let me bring those up. So test machine one, I'm not going to run any local files. I'm going to run a simulation or two and show you how that works. So let me do that now. So I have test machine one. I go to the simulation gallery. Or actually, no, I'm sorry. I go to simulations and I want to create a simulation. So I select all simulators. I select what simulation I want to run. Let's run because ransomware is a hot topic over the past week. We'll run a ransomware infection and we'll run it on test machine one. So we create the simulation and away it goes. So it's running now. I ran it to call, or yesterday to test it, but it's running now. So what you do is Let's say you go into the alerts queue. Now ignore all the rest of these, but what we're looking for is an alert for test machine one. So let's give it a minute. So it's still running. And again, the difference between the simulations and the tutorials is the simulations, there's no actual uh, uh, touching of the machine. You don't have to do anything. All you're interested in is seeing what Defender for Endpoint, its process of how it creates an alert, how it creates an incident possibly off multiple alerts if they're grouped together. And then it, you can actually watch it run through an automated investigation and resolution, hopefully. Okay, while that's running, let me walk you through the other two tutorials we'll be running and we'll see them all at the same time. So the next tutorial I'd like to run is a backdoor. It is for uh, a Word document 
that uh, this scenario simulates attacking uh, using a socially engineered lure document or uh, in a phishing email. So you get a document attachment in an email, you open that document and it has embedded in it code that uh, uh, creates an executable on the desktop. Uh, it creates a run registry key and a uh, scheduled task. So its job basically is every time you boot up the machine, it runs the scheduled task or run once that uh, runs this executable to do something nefarious. Um, the And these are called um, ASAPs or auto start extensibility points. And ASAP is a scheduled task, a run command in the registry. Um, so if I run this, here we go, I'm always nervous. And it requires a password. What is that password? And that's Defender for Endpoint running, by the way, saying, oh, you have alerts. You can set it up where it makes noises or sends you an email, things like that. So I'm about to run the demo. It says click OK. I'm going to click OK, and away it goes. So again, what it's done is it's doing something there. Attack scenario completed. Press any key to close. So what this did is created an executable on my desktop. Of course, in the real world, it's not going to be that noticeable. It's going to be buried in uh, some system directory. Um, it's created a scheduled task. You know what? It didn't create a scheduled task. I wonder if Defender for Endpoint already blocked that. Anyway, it would normally create a scheduled task in here. And as well, it would create a run um, registry key. So again, every time you boot up your machine, it's going to run one of those ASAPs to kick off this executable, which is currently on the desktop. So let me run the third one, and then we'll go into the console and take a look at what all these have done. The third one is a fileless attack. So this is um, basically a script that is run, executed in memory. Uh, a user could be uh, tr uh, tricked into executing it, uh, uh, or it could be run remotely from another machine that's already been infected. Um, uh, so basically, this it can be run either double clicking a script, run through a uh, loading a web page, run through a remote execution on a machine that's already infected. Um, and it's difficult to, to detect fileless uh, intrusions because so many administrators use scripts every day. They run scripts, so it's hard to detect that a malicious script is is um, moving around. So what this code does, it launches a notepad and that simulates an attack code, which is uh, injected into it. That attack code attempts to communicate with an external IP address. So let's go ahead and run this. And away we go. And you keep hearing all my uh, my dings, that's um, Defender for Endpoint saying, oh my gosh, bad things are happening. So this says a shell code was just injected to this process. Um, we're going to keep this open to watch the auto remediation action. All right, so we've run three demos. Let's go back into Defender for Endpoint and make some sense of all this. So the first thing we see, let's see if this is new. No, nothing new. Let me do a refresh. Okay, now let's go down to alerts. I think alerts looks newer. 
So yes, we have some alerts and they're already remediating, as you can see, uh, in an investigation state. So let's go into the um, ransomware one. So you go into the ransomware alerts and what you can do is drill down. You can always drill down in any alert and see the actual code that has been run and what it's doing. So you can see that this ransomware was detected. Um, you can see that it's the WannaCrypt uh, ransomware. Um, you can see that, uh, hold on a second. You can see on the right-hand side, the activity that's going on with it. So you can see it's fallen under an automated investigation. It's partially remediated, meaning you can see that it's actually doing something. Um, you can, all right, come on, Defender. Well, that's a bummer. Let's go back into it. Um, you can also, you can classify an alert. You can say it's a true alert or a false alert. So that way you can build a database of things that you don't want uh, them to create an alert, an incident, or do a remediation for. Um, let me go back into this. So another alert we ran was for the suspicious process injection observed. This was the um, this was the uh, this third um, detection we ran, which was the fileless script. This you can see that it is run suspicious process injected um, into Notepad. Uh, where was that? Notepad.exe. You can see again that it's um, linked to another incident. So you can click on link to an incident. In fact, let's go into the incident queue. And now maybe it is built out an incident for what's currently going on. It has. So 511s. See, these are all new incidents. So you can see that if you expand some of them, they may have multiple uh, in, uh, multiple uh, alerts, but they all fall under one incident. So you see this um, ransomware attack has many uh, alerts but they all ro ro uh, roll under one uh, incident. So you can see the Locky ransomware was prevented. That's one alert. You can see a malware, uh, the crypto malware was detected um, and that was an alert. You can see that Locky was already partially remediated, which means they removed some of the files or removed some of the uh, ASAPs that were going on. Uh, crypto is currently being um, remediated. So again, incidents, you could see that if an incident fall or alerts fall under the same incident category, it'll lump them together. Uh, let me go to the, uh, yeah, this is the, um, no, what I'm looking for is the back door. Let's see. You know, virus endpoint, test machine two, there it is. Okay, so what I want to show you with this is this is the one where I had the, um, yes, this is where I had the back door. And what I want to show you in the uh, graph section of the incident is how cool they will graph out what's going on with a intrusion. So if it was multiple machines already infected, this graph would show a a web of machines that haven't been infected. And what's also nice about this, not only will it detect the machine, but it'll show you the files that have been used, the files that have been um, molested, and the file and maybe um, uh, scheduled tasks updated, run once key that was updated. Um, so this is a cool way to see what files and functions were touched by this virus and how impactful has this been already? Who has been, defender who has seen who's been detected or uh, infected already? So that's a cool way to go about that. So if we go to our automated investigations, you'll see that um, the, for the third demo, I have it, if you recall, I said, don't run the automated investigation 
while this file is open, I set it up so we're waiting for the device or we're, we're waiting for someone to say, go ahead and run this remediation. Um, you can set up for it again to auto run every time. You could set up for it to only notify every time, uh, or you can set up for it to only certain events you want notification or let the administrator click go on it. So now those are running. Now that I click the little blue button, the little blue button means go ahead and kick it off, kick the auto remediation off. Um, so let's go down to suspicious process injection. This was the uh, back door. So it shows that uh, the, this, uh, the process is in, or the, it is in process. So it shows the test machine three what device was affected. Uh, it shows a suspicious process injection observed. It shows, uh, oh, good, it's still running, but waiting for a device to actually re uh, resolve this incident. Um, so that, that's basically it. It's, uh, I would recommend going through as many evaluations as you can, because the more you get comfortable with what it looks like, what a ransomware, how Defender handles a ransomware attack, um, how Defender handles back doors, um, things like that. You get a better understanding of what's real, what's false, what is a big security risk, and what is um, something you just need to call someone up and you know slap their hand. Um, yeah, that's it. That's it in a nutshell. Um, any questions about the simulations? Okay, and I also want to mention too, as far as the simulations and labs, um, if you want a uh, personal demo of some features, uh, let us know. We I gladly sit down with you. We can go through a couple of these simulations, and we can go in even more detail on what it's doing and how it's doing it. So next, I want to talk about the Microsoft 365 O 365 roadmap specific to Defender for Endpoint. Uh, let me pull that up. So if you guys aren't familiar with the uh, Microsoft 365 roadmap, this gives you, uh, for many products, an idea of what just launched, what's coming up for different products, and it gives you an idea of uh, what you can possibly do in the future. So we're only interested in uh, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, and you can see what's been released already, December 2020, uh, a new one is May 2021, and that's Microsoft Defender for Endpoint web filtering. So this feature uh, for Endpoint enables security administrators to track and regulate access to websites uh, based off of specific content web filtering. Um, the uh, Chris touched on how it was always a third product. Well, now Defender for Endpoint has integrated these features uh, through a third party product into their own uh, console. So that's kind of cool that web filtering is now done through the console itself and not a third party product. Um, another one we have is, what's the other one I wanted to look at? Um, so now there's support for uh, management for Windows 8.1. Um, software vulnerability assessment, uh, as well as configuration assessment. So basically 8.1 devices are now supported, as well as Mac, threat and vulnerability management for Mac. Um, that came out, uh, well, not that long ago. Uh, as I mentioned, Mac and Linux, Unix are now supported. Um, and it's not that difficult, uh, especially if you're using a delivery product for Mac OS like uh, Jam for any other products, it's a pretty easy way to get it out there and um, get them onboarded. I just did a um, impact analysis for Mac machines as well as window machines for Defender for Endpoint. For Windows machines, there is no real impact because it's leveraging tools already on the machine such as Windows Defender or Microsoft Defender antivirus. 
Uh, in the Mac OS world, there wasn't much impact either. It's a pretty lightweight uh, client and it didn't really have uh, any uh, impact on the device. So uh, to finish up the uh, series roadmap, do you uh, just want to mention anything, Chris? Uh, yeah, I mean, just kind of recap in you know our schedule for uh, upcoming webinars. You know, we'll be continuing with the BitLocker deployment management, and uh, you know, this is hopefully building upon each session. Um, you know, we're we're helping paint that story of how to establish a, a strong and robust endpoint management strategy. So as we you know continue through our series, uh, when we look near the end of the year, we're we're kind of wrapping up with you know and getting past. Uh, um, analyzing what you have, enforcing the configurations, um, enforcing compliance and security controls, managing mobile devices, and then kind of wrapping up with, you know, how do you clean up the environment? Because uh, uh, you do have to manage your, your endpoints even as they are retired out of your environment. So, um, Rick, I know we have a, a few more minutes here, and uh, um, I didn't see any other questions coming through the chat, but I was wondering, um, would you be able to walk through a little bit some of the the individual endpoint capabilities? So when you select the devices from the portal, you know, being able to uh, initiate some manual activity. So if you were responding to a breach, you know, some of the things that you could uh, um, perform through the endpoint manager or not the endpoint manager, the uh, defender for endpoint uh, console. Or hate to put you on the spot, but uh, no, no worries. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Yeah, there are there are some limited functionality you can do through the Defender Console. Um, uh, one of the, hold on, so I give it a second. One of the things you can do is you can run a scan um, from a, the console on a device. So let's say there's a uh, an alert or an incident that's be, been created on a device. You can actually run a antivirus scan. You can run a partial or quick scan, and you can run a full scan. Um, some of the uh, other things you can do is you can collect an investigation package. An investigation package is a way of uh, collecting a lot of information uh, on a machine, more than the council itself natively gives you, to start analyzing what may be going on with it. Um, exa for example, an investigation package will give you what patch level are they at? What uh, branch? What you know? What things could be missing on the machine? Um, if an automated investigation isn't uh, automatically kicked off, or let's say you don't do automated investigations, but you're confident that you want to kick off an investigation, you can do that on the machine. Um, you can re, uh, you restrict app execution for known bad apps, or let's say you don't want them to run, um, you know, uh, uh, weather bug or something on their, their machine. You can restrict apps execution. Um, you can isolate the device. Let's say there's all kind of, uh, you know, a, a virus storm happening on a device. You can isolate it. Um, that way it'll give you some protection uh, while you fix what's going on. Um, so yeah, th those are basically the things you can do from Defender for Endpoint on a local device. Um, the running a antivirus scan, you could actually set policies to run scans. Um, there, well, you guys know there are multiple ways you can do that. You can do that through group policy, you can do that through Microsoft Endpoint Manager, and you can also do that through uh, a configuration for Defender uh, Security Center. Hey Rick, what's the live response session? The live response session is you actually can connect to a device. Um, you can connect to, uh, anyway, you can connect to a uh, device, kind of like remote, uh, uh, Windows remote, but not quite because you're con connect to their uh, security environment. You're gonna connect to their uh, um, security logs. Um, things like that. So that's that's what that is. Yeah, I believe that's actually a uh, it's a command line, a remote command line interface, but it's not as uh, 
friendly as just running like remote PowerShell. It's, it's more right. similar to like uh, Azure command line to where there's a, I won't call it a proprietary or a unique language, but it's a different syntax than PowerShell, but it is a, a command line interface. Right. And what's nice about it is it just focused on security logs and security information. So. There was one other option in there for a consult a, a I think it says a threat expert or a threat. Yeah, yep. you might see that throughout other contextual uh, menus throughout Defender for Endpoint, and that's actually a a third, not a third party, a, an external paid service from Microsoft. So Microsoft gives you direct access to their internal security operations center uh, personnel through the consult a threat expert. Um, you do have to sign up for that feature. It is fairly costly. I believe the last time I checked, it was just shy of a thousand or a hundred thousand dollars a year for uh, two incidents per month to get their insights and guidance and pretty much their hand holding. But um, you know, in a scenario to where you have a an active breach or a uh, mass attack on your environment. $100,000 might be a drop in the bucket compared to the financial cost it could it could be for taking down your entire business for a couple of days. So, um, but just that is a paid service through Microsoft and you have to sign up for it. I guess I'd like to finish this uh, this meeting and presentation with a just a quick discussion and let's get some uh, opinions on that current ransomware incident with the the pipeline. What What is uh, everyone's interpretation of that? Do you think we're well behind the curve with some of these products? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by like, do you think the, the clients or, or corporations in general are behind the curve or um yes. so I, I i i'd like to think no i think it's a maybe a result of the the pandemic and not being able to properly manage devices so they're off network they can't be you know as fully patched and controlled and and uh up to date as they can be mm -hmm. um the other piece uh, we all know from on the email side the phishing attacks and those things are getting more and more sophisticated they're they're harder and harder to differentiate from a real attack. Um, but I also, for this particular one, I feel like there's more to it than they're telling us um, just because of the scope of it. I don't know what tells me that, but it just seems like there's just not quite enough information. And it could be they're withholding it to work with the attackers to try and recover some of the systems mm. uh, and not, they don't want to put throw too much light on it just yet. Just, you know, just my my hunch. I read an article where the majority of attacks you never hear about because it shows a weakness in an organization, so they don't want to communicate that they've been breached. Um, so I'm assuming, especially in the financial area, it happens frequently. Well, a lot of them um, have reporting requirements, so they have to do a certain level of investigation, and if it's proven to be impactful, uh, there's exposure to customer data, those type of things. They have to report it. Um, if it if they've lost data, but there's no uh, reasonable expectation of leaked data or stolen credentials, they actually don't have to report it. It's kind of weird mm. how it works. Mm. So, you know, for encryption, you know, it's one of the things we we tell people. You have some some baked in uh, defense against ransomware if you're leveraging Office 365 uh, through versioning. So. If your OneDrive gets your files in OneDrive get encrypted, your minus one versions are all still normal, right? So you can you can roll back and recover from there. It's still not fun. I would still be vigilant on the uh, on the endpoint on the protection side and on the you know, education and awareness side for uh, helping people understand um, you know what phishing attacks look like, where they are today, run the awareness training, run the the simulated attacks, and and help people understand, you know, when when it's OK, when it's not OK. All right, Chris, I believe we're done if no one has any questions. All right. 
Well, I appreciate everyone attending today's webinar. Um, and, uh, you know, as we mentioned before, we do have our upcoming webinar next month. I believe it was June 15th, where uh, Chris Ball will be talking about BitLocker, so endpoint encryption, um, and how that plays into your overall endpoint management strategy. Um, so I appreciate, again, every, pre appreciate everyone's time for joining. If uh, you don't uh, ever have any questions, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. I will be sending out a uh, session feedback uh, survey. And uh, I know you guys probably get tired of receiving those from other, uh, pretty much everywhere these days. But um, you know, we do appreciate any feedback we can collect, and we really try to tailor these webinars to uh, provide you the most value. So uh, your feedback is critical to ensuring that we are uh, doing just that. So, with that being said, uh, appreciate everyone for joining in, and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks. Great work, guys.